Today's show is sponsored by Janice Henderson Investors. In an environment where allocators face more questions than answers, having a trusted partner is critical. Janice Henderson Investors is committed to building partnerships with institutional investors based on collaboration, insights, and transparency with the goal of helping clients generate desired investment outcomes. With 26 offices and 350 investment professionals worldwide, Janice Henderson has the scale to offer global perspective across equities, fixed income, and alternatives, and the depth to offer local expertise and support for clients. To learn more about partnering with Janice Henderson, visit JaniceHenderson.com slash U.S. Institutional. Today's show is also sponsored by ThirdBridge. ThirdBridge is a widely used provider of expert interview transcripts whose clients include past guests on the show. Their content covers both public and private companies in any sector across all the major geographies around the world. To give you a sense, last year, over 16,000 investment professionals from 1,000 firms across private equity, public equity, and credit downloaded approximately 500,000 interview transcripts from ThirdBridge Forum. Each of those transcripts covers a one-hour in-depth interview between an unbiased sector analyst and an industry executive. I've seen the platform and the coverage is incredible, ranging from mature mega caps to leading edge innovators like Stripe and SpaceX to thematic topics like crypto exchanges and alternative energy in China to just about everything in between. ThirdBridge created this category of research and has by far the largest content platform available. If you're an asset manager or capital allocator looking to better understand your manager's positioning, visit thirdbridge.com slash capital for a try. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. My guest on today's show is Greg Dowling, the CEO and head of research at Fund Evaluation Group, or FEG, a mid-market investment consultant with around $80 billion in discretionary and non-discretionary assets under advisement. Greg oversees the day-to-day management of the research team and chairs the firm's investment policy committee that oversees all manager hire and fire decisions. Our conversation covers Greg's background and introduction to FEG, the evolution of institutional consultants, FEG's business today, and its unique advantages. We dive into how FEG supports its clients with portfolio management, manager selection, and inventory management, due diligence, including qualitative scoring and culture assessment, and working with investment committees. We then get Greg's opinion on different market dynamics, including private equity, venture capital, crossover funds, hedge funds, and what he refers to as weird ideas. We close with the evolution of the investment process post-COVID, Greg's involvement with his alma mater, the University of Cincinnati, and the coveted FEG Hockey Classic. I hope you enjoy the show. And if you do, this week, why not reach out to one of your best friends and tell them, hey, I know we talk all the time, but I don't think I had a chance to tell you about the Capital Allocators podcast. At the end, the host always asks the guests what life lesson they've learned that they wish they knew a lot earlier in life. I was wondering what yours is. And by the way, the podcast is awesome. You should check it out. Thanks so much for spreading the word. And while you're at it, hop on iTunes and leave a rating or write a review. Thanks for your support. Please enjoy my conversation with Greg Dowling. Greg, it's great to see you. Ted, thanks for having me. So now, Greg, I know most of us grow up wishing and dreaming they're going to be an investment consultant. (laughs) (laughs) So I'd love you to just talk me through your path for how you got to FEG. Yeah. And I've been at FEG for quite a while. So I'm going on 18 years. So first job out of college was a financial analyst at a bank doing commercial lending. A few years there, MBA went to a asset manager and 
It's an asset manager no one's heard of, but maybe the tie-in that people would know is affiliated managers group. So AMG, we are an affiliate of AMG. And that acquisition actually took place while I was at the firm. It was weird. They put us together with another group and AMG is wonderful, but the other group they kind of put us together with, it was just not a great, not a great synergy. And he started thinking, wow, what can I do? And that firm that I worked at was pretty quirky. So we had great numbers and they thought they could get us in the rap channels. Value shop that did not only value equities, but we did convertible bonds. We did discounted closed end funds. So we'd take advantage of big discounts and we would do kind of these RB things like, but they were just completely unhedged and naked. So we'd buy a company that was getting acquired because you could get it at a discount. And we'd look at spinoffs and spin outs and things like that. At the time, I was studying for my CFA and it kind of had this epiphany when I was reading the hedge fund area, like, hey, people hedge these things. They don't just go into it, go into <laughs> it naked. And FEG was in town and had a uh, friend from school who I also studied with for the CFA. And sometimes I'd actually study at the offices of FEG. We'd take turns studying at each other's offices, a group of us. But I had no idea what FEG did. Zero. And at one point, he's like, hey, you should come work at FEG. I'm like, well, what does FEG do? And so that, then I had to be educated a little bit on what a consultant does. And at the time, they were looking for someone in the alternatives investment area. We had one group, and that group was pretty small. This is 2004. And they were looking to have specialists in private equity or in hedge funds. And I took the hedge fund track. And I had done enough hedge fund trades and had the MBA, CFA, so sort of like they took a chance on me, even though I didn't have any prior hedge fund experience. And it was a great ride. So it came about it in a, in a weird way, but I've been here 18 years and it's a pretty transient industry. Being someplace for 18 years, it's great to see the firm grow and also our people grow. I'd love to hear your perspective on the consulting business over that time. And particularly as kind of a mid-market consultant, what's evolved over those 18 years? Well, there's not a lot of us left. The history of consulting, there were a few firms that were started in the 70s, but a lot of them were started in the 80s. We were started in, in 88. And they were usually started by a few individuals, probably in their, at the time, late 30s, early 40s, had some experience. And it all came out of this period where a lot of institutions were managed alongside of retail and high net worth and usually by a regional broker or a bank trust department. And so there wasn't this embrace of passive indexes. So Vanguard just came along in the 70s. And even though it existed, it wasn't really adapted. Alternatives and institutions are very different than individuals, right? You don't have taxes. You have infinite timeline. You may have better resources. So to be treated in the same way where you're high dividend paying stocks versus a total return approach, it didn't take much for a handful of people all over the country within a 10, 15 year period to leave startup consulting practices, whether they're focused on pensions or they're focused on ENFs or a region. And so all of the business really started at that point in time. Now, fast forward to the last decade or so, these people that started in their 30s and 40s, you know, they're 60 and 70 years old and they need a liquidity event. And even if they've passed down the partnership and expanded it, it's still hard for junior partners to buy something where there aren't any hard assets. Your people in consulting are your assets. They leave every day on the elevators. And so that's hard. So you've seen a lot of consolidation. We were talking sort of about all the different firms and you used to do the, the quarterly consultant updates with them and none of them are around anymore. So it's really changed. What is it about FEG that has allowed you to stay independent and compete? I think we were on that same path for a while. I mean, call it maybe six, seven years ago, we started looking at our partnership and it's a layered cake, right? You have different partners, but you have certain layers that are a little thicker. And we were going to have a pretty good size vintage year that would be retiring at the same point in time. So we came to this crossroads and we're like, well, what are we going to do? 
And I remember every partner's meeting and every partner's offsite for like three or four years, we're like, well, what do you want to do? Because we wanted to remain independent. We didn't want to be forced to sell. And so we came up with a ESOP structure. So we're an ESOP. There's a handful of other ESOPs in financial services, a little unusual, but what it allowed us to do is make sure everybody's an owner. So everybody at FEG is an owner of FEG and that's helped. And so we're five years into that and that's allowed us to be independent. What are the strengths and weaknesses of being smaller than some of the bigger players? There are strengths and weaknesses and it's about fit. So most of our clients are not-for-profits, and we don't do any big public pensions, sovereign wealth. So if you're a $200 million community foundation, and you're dealing with one of our competitors who may also do pensions, I mean, they're $10, $15 trillion. You've interviewed some of these people. They're great. They absolutely do wonderful work, but that's probably not a great fit for a lot of them. Because what is their advantage? Their advantage is their size. They can invest in smaller managers, emerging managers. That's harder to do with a giant consulting firm. But what do those giant consulting firms have? Well, they have probably services that we don't, especially on the pension side. They're going to have in-house actuaries. They're going to use their size to push down some of the fees. That's the one big lever they have. We'll use that lever too. We'll ask for most favored nation. But Certainly, they have an advantage when they have all that money versus us. We're going to try to find those smaller managers. And to paraphrase uh, Warren Buffett, I always love some of his quotes. He was talking about the growth of Berkshire Hathaway. And when he was talking about Berkshire Hathaway in the beginning, he said, all we needed to do was find a few good investments. And then now it's about finding a few good, large investments. And that's harder to do. So walk me through the lump sum of FEG's business today. Sure. So like we were talking about the evolution of consulting and how the business grown, everybody was a traditional non-discretionary consultant. And that's still the bulk of our business, but discretionary is growing. And we've had discretionary services. When I say discretionary, this is OCIO. We've had it for about 15 years, but it was probably more oriented to smaller clients. So we'd have a a university and someone on the board might say, look, I also serve on this small community foundation in this college town. We meet twice a year. It's all volunteer staff and no one knows anything about investing. So you're like, well, from our governance and resource structure probably makes sense to be OCIO. And so we started our practice to fill that void. What's changed is the size of the institution that are outsourcing. It's pretty incredible. You have, you know, billion dollar institutions that are, that are outsourcing. So for us in our development, it was really making sure that we had the right offerings for those larger clients. They want different things. And then also embracing some ambiguity because there's this there's a lot of stuff in the middle. We call it hybrid, where it, it may be taking discretion of just the back office. So maybe, especially on the private capital side, you have lots of docs and they give them to you late and they want them back early. And that's hard for a staff if you don't have uh, the right resources. So it might be just taking care of that. Or it might be the investment team there has a lot of experience in more traditional investments and they want to outsource the private capital. So our business has gone from a hundred percent consulting to a mix of consulting OCIO and something in the middle called hybrid. I'd love to dive in to the investing side. How do you think about, you've got a lot of different clients though. You mentioned mostly nonprofits. Where do you start when you've got so many different clients? So the first thing that we do say, this is a new client is we'll do, we have some questionnaires that we send them. Because everybody tells you that, hey, we are we don't mind a little risk. Let's quantify that. So what does that mean to you? We'll have a committee, for example, go through a discovery process to try to figure out what that means and what are their hot button issues? What's your sort of risk return parameters? How much illiquidity can you handle? So that's kind of the starting process is, Everybody tells you something. And then when it gets down to the rubber meets the road, it can be very different. 
What are the types of questions you ask to take those generalities and calibrate them in numbers? One question would just be, how much of a loss are you willing to take? Because everybody says they're long-term until there's losses. And then you're like, whoa, I, we're down 10% in a quarter. Like, well, you told us your risk tolerance was higher. So a little bit of, of that, you try to get a sense for patients. We also try to get a sense for the continuity of the committee. Is the investment committee all on the same page? Because if it's not, that's tough too. So if half the committee says, hey, we really want to take advantage of time arbitrage and we'll be concentrated in some contrarian areas, we're a long-term investor, we're going to ride out the storm. And then you have a few of the other investment committees who may be vocal and said, no, that's not what I'm looking for. I've got two years left in my term and I don't want to go out like this. So the magnitude, the continuity are two big areas that we'll focus on. And then once you figured out the risk structure, layer on asset allocation, how do you guys work within the portfolios? Yeah. So one, you try to figure out what's the right delivery mechanism for them. What kind of services do they want? So through that, you might say, well, if you want to do private capital, here's what you got to do. We're going to come to you. Staff from, I think last year, I think 80% of the funds that we recommended were single closes or oversubscribed. And so you're going to get the docs late and you got to turn around quick. Can you do that? Is that going to tax the overall resources of the firm? So you start thinking about like the resources. How often are you going to meet? Are you going to meet quarterly? Are you going to meet monthly, weekly? Are you going to have subcommittees? How quickly can you look at these opportunities? If the best hedge fund manager is open because there's a downturn in the market, but they're only open for a short period of time, can your committee meet? So you try to think about those types of things so you figure out the next step. So what we talked about earlier in the discovery phase is a little bit about the recipe. The next step is really the ingredients. And you can get some funky ingredients in there or you can kind of go a little bit uh, plain vanilla. And, and oftentimes you can get pretty close. So that's where you kind of figure out what that looks like. So let's get into brass tacks a little bit on the ingredients. Sure. Broadly talk about manager selection. Like what are your biases? Maybe go across asset classes. This is where I spend a lot of my time. I'll start general and then we'll get a little specific because specific's more fun. What we do or I do in my department, it's a little bit like a factory in a warehouse. So we're always looking to figure out what our clients' needs are. So we try to do some some work at the beginning of the year, really kind of late the, the previous year to see well, how much private capital do they need? Are they looking to add small caps? So you try to get an idea of, of what we have. And then you look at your current inventory list and you're like, ah, boy, a couple of these I know are closing really soon. We probably need to have more inventory here. I feel like sometimes you run a grocery store and I need to have enough toothpaste, but I can't have an aisle of toothpaste. So you're going to have commingled vehicles that some people are going to want. Some people want to separately manage to count. They, some are going to want to have it in the ETF. Some are going to want within a category, a little higher octane. Some are going to be eh, a little more conservative in that same category. So you try to find, just like toothpaste, you might have like, this is more whitening, this is for sensitive gums. And so you try to have enough, but you can't have too much because you have a whole store. So you can't just focus on small cap. What about large cap? What about fixed income? So it's about trying to figure that all out because at the end of the day, if we screw up in what we bring on, we have to monitor it, we have to do quarterly calls, the team doesn't like to do that when there's no money. The managers hate it so when we're sending them questionnaires and doing our quarterly call with them and our annual onsite. And they're like, we have no money from you. Why are we doing this? It's a bit of a balancing act. So that's kind of how the, that process starts. And it's, sometimes it's not even inventory based. It may be opportunity based. I mean, sometimes when the financial crisis hit, I mean, right after that, even though subprime was at the epicenter, it was pretty cheap. So structured credit was a great place to be. Well, gosh, I didn't. You know, we know a little bit about structured credit. We don't know much about distress structured credit. And so sometimes you have to beef up on an area, drill down, learn about it. And then sometimes a manager is coming back to market or is reopening, and you don't need that. You already have all the toothpaste that you need. But man, this is good toothpaste. So you add them. That's kind of the balance between having the right inventory and the right opportunities. And then once you go from that, you start building market maps of the different areas and who you want to invest in. 
And so let's be specific here. I'll do hedge funds because I started as a hedge fund guy. We know that in the early days, the hedge fund databases were just terrible. They were just terrible. And they've come a long way. So much more robust, but there's still holes in them. So each of these asset classes is going to have kind of its unique ecosystem. And with hedge funds, the ecosystem revolves really around prime brokers. If you're a hedge fund, you need a prime broker. So instead of having to go out and talk to 9,000 hedge funds, we can start by talking to the prime brokers and ask them who's launching in the new year. Who do you think is interesting? Maybe it's an area that we're trying to build up. They can be very helpful. And so we use that to fill in the gaps in a database, we would use clients. A lot of our clients, we've been blessed with some clients that have started hedge funds, C-suite on hedge funds. So they might have some ideas. We might talk to them about a manager and they're like, eh, I worked with him on the Goldman uh, fixed income desk. What else do you got? All right, well, what do you think we should do? Because people sit on, often people sit on numerous committees. So you do that, you build up your Rolodex, you take all that together And then you figure out how much toothpaste do I want? And that's where you go. When you're building out that inventory or putting a manager in the warehouse, what does the research process look like for an individual manager? Yeah, so it's a balance. It's both the the quantitative and the qualitative. And I'd probably say we're a blend. There are certainly, this is where it gets the nuances of differences in consultants. Some are very, very quantitative. And we're quantitative too. But we would tell you that that explains how they did in the past it may or may not explain how they do in the future, right? It's all backwards looking and teams change and people change. So we do that. We have a director of quantitative research that works with all of our individual, again, breaking it up a little bit. So let's take hedge funds. We'll stay in the hedge fund area. We might look at a manager and break out. Let's say it's a long, short equity manager. We'll get their returns, both long and short. We would get their exposures and we'll try to break it out and say, what was their long alpha, their short alpha? What is just leverage? What is their returns by market timing? So changing their exposures around. You look at different periods of time. This is probably the most helpful. Say, like, how did you do in 2008? Or how did you do in March of 20? Take that, take an investment letter, start talking through it. We have an open door policy, so we'll take meetings with anybody. And so we have all this information out there and we start to build peer universes. So we'll look at them versus peers. You know, at some point you're doing a deeper dive. You're going on site, maybe multiple times. A couple of unique things that we do is we have a process we call QER. So it's a qualitative evaluation review. And this is where we try to quantify the qualitative. So culture is a big thing. And this is tough. This has been the toughest part during COVID because it's really hard to pick up culture in a virtual setting. But culture is important. And so if somebody is telling you that it's a very collegial work environment and then you go there and everybody's working in offices with their doors closed, you start going, "Ah, tell me more about this collegial environment. And so we try to score. So we have two different analysts score our six investment tenants. And it's a little bit of our Rosetta Stone. We use that for any of our different asset classes. And so it's conviction, it's culture, it's consistency, it's pragmatism, it's risk controls and active return. And active return is last. And we use this to help to try to measure some of these qualitative things. Because if I ask a younger analyst, what did you think about culture? Usually I'll say, it was good. Oh, it's always good. And if you ask another one, they'd be like, it was really good. So between good and real good, what is that? I put a number to that. And so we have them score that. And that's really helpful to look at not only on the front end, but through time. And it's also good to, I'm using good again, lots of goods in our language is the look at the difference between them. So if one gave a a four, we usually do a a zero to four. So if if one did four being the best and then one had two, well, that's a pretty big gap. Let's sit them down and say, well, why did you do four? What did you pick up on that I didn't? That's kind of a pretty useful tool. And then we'll also have a devil's advocate. So we'll assign somebody to the process to shoot holes in it. And we try to find natural tie-ins. So 
for example, if we're doing a private debt manager and it is mainly sponsor backed, it's great to get the buyout analyst involved because they hold hands together. They're financing that business and industry. So it's interesting to talk to the buyout team and the private equity team and say, hey, talk to a few of your managers. I noticed that XYZ private debt fund has been doing a lot of their deals and get them involved. So we try to do that. I think that's an advantage of our size. We're big enough to cover the beachfront. We're not so big where analysts don't know each other and don't have this like, hey, I, well, this makes sense. Like we're looking at a couple couple areas that I'm not even sure what they are, if they're real assets or they're kind of diversifying strategies. That's the great process. So devil's advocate, we have our, our QERs. You write a research report. It goes to our investment policy committee. I chair that. We approve it, and then it's good to go. So that's the process from start to finish. So a lot of times at firms where you have different teams of analysts, from a manager's perspective, they never quite know like who the team is. Sometimes there's the consultant in the field, and then there's the research team. And how does that work at FEG? So I hear that all the time, and some of the firms seem a little Byzantine in how you, you approach that. We try to be pretty research-centric. And the nice thing about FEG, so I've been here for 18 years. Many of the sector heads that I manage have been here longer than I have. So it doesn't change that often. So you know who the fixed income guy is, or the real assets person is. And so it's really easy to do, but we all try to funnel it through. I mean, yeah, sometimes a consultant may get involved, but we, we are different. We're not so big because a lot of these bigger firms have created different offices with liaisons between consultants and research. And you know, we just haven't had to do that yet. Hopefully we never have to do that. And so it's all pretty much driven here. So find out who the sector head is and call them or email them. Really curious on this culture assessment. It's one thing to have someone say, I think that's a four. Yeah. I think that's a two. How do you get some consistency in your evaluation of a firm's culture? The first thing I'd say is there's no one culture. And we're not looking for the exact same culture. We are just looking for a culture that is appropriate for the strategy and how they're set up. So for example, let's say, let's go back to that very collegial firm. We're collegial, we share. And then the compensation structure is eat what you kill. Wow, that's a disconnect there. And so you try to look at is the culture supportive of their investment strategy? Because eat what you kill can be fine, but you just understand that's the culture that you live in. And there's been some uh, very successful firms that have been, have been that way. So you look for that. You just want to understand the culture because many firms are coached. On, there's a lot of firms out there, PR firms that say, hey, here's what consultants are looking for. You need to use these buzzwords. And they're incongruent. And so that's what you're really looking for versus a one culture where we have a bias towards. It feels like the subtle things in culture, a lot of it come out of meeting with a group of people at the same time and face-to-face -face meetings. And I'm, I'm kind of curious over the last couple of years through COVID, not so much like obviously you had to adapt, but what do you think this looks like going forward on these types of assessments? Yeah, you're right. I mean, it was really hard at the beginning of COVID. So first few months, I think we all thought, well, you know, they'll we'll be locked down for a couple months and then we'll be back on the road. And then we had a variant and another variant and it kept going and going and going. So you have to adapt. And we tried to adapt the best we could. So we really em embraced it. That's still the hardest one to pick up on. You can augment that a little bit through the number of reference checks that you do. So maybe instead of doing five, you do 15, you do a little bit more. And then we've started to get a little bit smarter and we're still doing this. Do calls individually. It's really difficult to do a group Zoom or Teams call in terms of due diligence because you might have people talking over each other. You can't pick up on individual Brady Bunch boxes that when the senior PM talks, the number two rolls his eyes. It's not even worthwhile trying to pick that up. So do it individually. And then when you get on site, try to do a couple more of these group meetings where you can pick up some of the dynamics. 
We've also done a little bit of training on just trying to read body language. So what are little tips and cues that you do, which is frightening because you learn these things and, and then when your wife's talking to you and you're like, wait a minute, I'm picking up on something. So we try to do little things like that. We've also uh, a handful of times had people just take a phone and put their video on and like FaceTime, walk around the office so we can see what their office looks like. Because that kind of gives you a sense of culture a little bit. Is it a fun place? Is it a serious place? I mean, those are little things that you can do to fill that gap. You ask, where is it going? I think it's going to be a little bit of both. I think our meetings will be more meaningful and that instead of doing a marathon all day meeting on site where we're exhausted and they're exhausted or we're flying to Hong Kong and our eyes are rolling back in our head, we're jet lagged, we barely remember the meeting, we can do a lot of that stuff virtually and then go there and spend time maybe as a group, Maybe you can go to dinner and see how they act socially. So I I think it'll be better. And I think we'll be able to do more. The problem is you can almost overschedule. We found that we almost overscheduled Zoom calls. We know Zoom fatigue is real. So you mentioned body language cues. And I know a lot of times people have this CIA training. You get all excited about the one week. Are there any of the things that you've learned that you've been able to kind of retain and use over time? So I don't have a lot of great examples. I mean, there's a few examples where we've looked at, you could just tell people aren't excited. They're telling you that they're excited about the opportunity set, but their body language is telling you something different. Now, it could just be that that's a a bad day. They got got a fight with their kid before he went to school. I mean, who who knows, right? But those are little things if, if, if you start picking up on, you can ask. And that's probably the best examples that we have to date. You work with a lot of committees and I'd love to hear your lessons about what works in highly functioning committees and maybe a horror story or two of what you see that really doesn't. Every committee is so different. They have very different personalities and by changing one or two people, it can be night and day. And so a lesson is make sure you have good governance, make sure you have a a really strong IC chair Make sure everybody's rolling in the same direction. If not, pause, go back, do a little bit more discovery work, try to get people back together. Also, uh, spend time on the relationship. So if you're going to, maybe it's a well-endowed theater group, try ask to go see a show and maybe go with a couple of the committee members. Get a real sense for who they are because that makes it, easier when times are tough. You want to make sure that it's not transactional. Make sure there's continuity. Make sure that everybody's kind of thinking about the philosophy in the same way. Even though like you can talk about continuity, people can say like, yeah, we're, we're all, but yeah, okay, let's, what does that actually mean? So th- those would be a few tips. COVID has brought up a whole bunch of other, other tips because we've had virtual meetings, right? So virtual committee meetings are even tougher because you, you might have somebody who has bad audio. You might have people that are not paying attention. And you might have some people that are in person and some people that are not in person. And so the whole committee dynamic over COVID has really changed. We're also trying to change and adapt to that, just like we're adapting our research to this environment, trying to be more interactive. It is easy to drone on on a Zoom call because you can't pick up the cues. So be a little shorter, pause, make sure you're getting every box engaged. So those are a few little tips for uh, the COVID era or post-COVID era. So we're going to take a quick break from the conversation to tell you about S&P Global Market Intelligence. As alternative asset data grows more complex, You need an accurate, up-to-the-minute view of the market and your portfolio. You can build a 360-degree view of the private markets with trusted insights, data, and software tools from Market Intelligence. To learn more, visit spglobal.com slash allocators. And now, back to the show. Well, I'd love to dive into the markets a little bit. And we, you know, start at the asset class level. Why don't you pick one? And we'll just, we'll just go. Broad statement is that even though 
the markets are down this year. They're not down that much from their all-time high. And so when markets are near all-time highs, there's less to do. So you've got to be very careful because there's always this call to action, especially we have all kinds of geopolitical issues all over the place and inflation and all that kind of stuff. So you feel good if you do something. I'd say maybe you don't want to do as much. So that's one general comment across all asset classes. There is less to do because valuations aren't great. But it's really hard to time markets. So therefore, be diversified. That'll help when there's some great opportunities. So let's talk about what you can do. Even though there's not a lot to do, that doesn't mean there's nothing to do. And one of the areas that I think there's a great opportunity is on the private equity side. And it's not because private equity is going to generate all these great returns. It's that there is so much money being raised in private equity. The dry powder is amazing. Trillion dollars that's out there. It's a massive amount of money that's out there. So what do you do? Well, most of that money has been raised by the mega funds. It's like 80% when you get over 5 billion and it's maybe 50% when you get to a billion. So if you have the size and ability to invest in a buy and build buyout firm, so lower middle market and Roughly define that as EBITDA of like five to 30. Everybody says they invest in in lower middle market, but it's, ask them to define that. And these are oftentimes funds that are 500, maybe less than a billion dollars, smaller funds, but there are 30 plus more companies on the private side with revenues over $10 million than the US public market. So your opportunity set's just bigger. And there's always poorly run family businesses. Now I should say that they're even aware of the private equity bid. So they're, they're more expensive than they used to be, but they're still less expensive and you can grow those companies. You can do add-ons. You can kind of build a platform up and then you sell it up the food chain because they're going to deploy that money. If they don't deploy that money, they can't charge you. They are never going to return those dollars <laughs> to, to investors. And I think that's true with private real estate and private anything these days is if you can kind of focus on the smaller end and sell it up the food chain, leave a little fruit on the trees so that there isn't the ability for the next fund to make some money, you can pretty consistently make good returns. But I would say that these are lower returns than you got in the previous 10 years with private equity, but they're going to be a lot better than the returns in the public equity market. Curious how you're thinking about venture capital. There's so much going, returns have been extraordinary, pacing is coming back. There's always this access question. How have you approached it? Yeah, it's funny. One of my uh, colleagues is at one of the handful of big firms out there. (laughs) He was telling me that all the institutions that were there at this annual meeting, that like roughly a third of the returns were basically from this manager. (laughs) So if you had access, your returns are great. If you had access to a couple of those other managers out there, also your returns are great. But if outside of that, it's tough for sledding. So I think you have to be very cautious in venture. It is a access class, not just an asset class. And so that means you may not be able to do as much venture. There's still great venture companies out there. It's the new breed, the people that leave the larger firms and start up and do great at a smaller size. But you may want to substitute more growth equity versus venture because you just got to be very careful. Just because you have an allocation of venture capital, you shouldn't fill it if you don't have the right managers. How have you thought about all the convergence of particularly sort of late stage venture and maybe it's hedge funds, but public, you see it also in the long only public markets coming down. We were early adapters to some of that. And I think there was an ARB there that you could go out and say, look, I'm going to buy late stage, but I'm not going to sell. I'm going to hold it and I'm going to move quicker. And I'm not going to need as many board seats and got a big checkbook. That's worked really well. And that's been copied and copied and copied. I think it's going to be tough. I think you want to make sure you focus on the handful of managers that are really good at it because 
everybody is doing it. We, <laughs> we every either hedge fund, private equity fund, or long only equity manager are doing crossovers. And so, do they have the ability? Do they just hire a team and from somewhere else? So you really have to dig down and dig deeper because the other issue is that because everybody's focused on the late stage area, which has become very pricey, they're moving down, down rounds into lower and lower levels that they've never played in before. Some have, some of the bigger ones have, but some of the newer ones have not. And that's scary. I was just recently meeting with a few private equity managers who were talking about their portfolio companies. And we were talking about the same question. And it was uncanny because all of them said they were talking to these crossover managers and a couple names came up and they're like, oh, as soon as the Ukraine conflict started, they stopped returning my phone calls. (laughs) So it pulls back. It seems like it's pulled back a little bit. I think it's smart, but you got to be careful and don't go with the Johnny came lately. We both spent a lot of time in the hedge fund world. It's been a lot tougher place to be the last couple of years. How are you thinking about it and approaching it? Yeah, certainly it has been. Luckily, I think we were in the hedge fund area in the golden days, the halcyon days, and there were great parties and great swag. (laughs) It was a lot of fun. Like in this private equity bubble that we're living in, they're just not as fun. (laughs) Not as fun. Yeah, so they had a great run. They've had a really poor, poor run. I think we're generally pretty optimistic on hedge funds, especially like a multi-strategy type of manager, because they tend to do better when rates rise. Because for a long time, when you shorted, you might've had to actually pay or you weren't earning anything. So now you're actually getting something on your rebate. You're also seeing volatility and dispersion, which is good. You need dispersion, not just lockstep volatility. If everything's moving up and down, that's hard. Maybe a macro manager gets it. But most people are trying to take advantage, whether it's between two stocks or two bonds, of some divergence. And there's a lot more divergence. So what does it all mean? I think a good multi-strat manager can earn 6 or 7%. And that's nowhere near what it returned in the 90s, early 2000s but that might be pretty good this year. No one wanted that when the S&P was up 28%. But now when you have equity markets and fixed income markets down, pretty good. So we've even said for some investors, maybe you think about having some of the more conservative multi-strat hedge fund managers and think about it as a fixed income proxy. One of the things I know you have here is what you call your weird ideas group. Yes. Yes. And- you were kind enough to bring a Cordillera guys yeah. who'd certainly fit into that onto the show. We'd love to hear more about that team and what you do inside it. So we have all of our, as I said earlier, we have an open door policy. And if a analyst does a meeting with somebody that they're like, I took this meeting, I thought I was the right person for this group. But in fact, I don't know who the right person is for this group, but it was really interesting. Maybe it was... Uh, a fine art fund, or maybe it was carbon credit trading, whatever it is, but you thought it was interesting, we have a person that you just send it to. And there's a group of us that get together on a quarterly basis and kind of look through the ideas. And I'd say 95% of the time we pass. We just pass. Because they might be interesting ideas, but no one's going to invest them. And it's not worth the missionary work. There's a high bar, right? That you don't want to do things just for the sake of difficulty, right? It's not the Olympics. You don't get any points for difficulty. But every once in a while, you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. That's something that's interesting. You know, we did a pre this whole SPAC boom. We did a SPAC only fund that kind of made it. We've done, did an Argentina debt fund that was kind of a rifle shot. We've done a handful of interesting ideas in there. We're looking at barges now, like a triple net barge fund that could be interesting. A lot of times the thing that you have to be careful about is even though it's weird, it has a risk factor. And sometimes that risk factor is GDP, the economy. So you're like, oh, and this is really interesting. Aircraft securitizations and like, well, 
sometimes there's a hidden factor there. So you have to be careful, but that's how that group works. If nothing else, it keeps people stimulated and we get the opportunity to talk through some interesting, interesting scenarios. How do you make returns? What are the risks? And I think it helps us in our overall process. What's evolved and what do you continue to evolve as you look out the next couple of years in your investment process? We've got to train everybody on private capital. As you said, the crossover funds. We do try to have this devil's advocate process and the amount of private capital funds reups is just off the charts. And we're seeing private strategies in every asset class. It's one of the things that we have to do is do a better job of, of cross training and so that people can kind of step in and help out. And it also makes the analysts better because we don't have a hedge fund group. We call it diversifying strategies. That's mostly hedge funds, but there are some strategies that are uncorrelated that are private and that fall into that category. Can the hedge fund guys figure out how to do an IRR? We have to teach them these things. And that's an evolution is the world's going private. And so you need to make sure that your team can handle that. How have you thought about fees with the lens of things like co-investments and other activities that a lot of allocators are thinking about? How do you get at more of that return underneath? We've been doing co-invests for a handful of years now. We have a checklist approach that we look at it. Are they recommended? Have they done them before? Is it in their wheelhouse? Does it make sense? If it's on the private energy side and it's in the four corners and it's unconventional, we have no geologists on staff. And even if we did, we probably couldn't fly them out, have them do the work and make an investment decision. You're betting on the manager that you've known for a really long time and you're making sure that you're aligned with them And then you're like, if you do enough of these, they work out. So we do research and work on it, but I think you have to be very careful on the co-invest because you're hiring, you're paying them to bring you the ideas. You're doing a sanity check on it. But part of that checklist is the fee structure. So you want to look at that. I mean, ideally the best thing is no fees, no management fee, no carry, but that's changing, right? So everybody did that. And now you're seeing, well, how about at least a little carry? So carry can be okay if there's enough of a pref there. We pass most times when there's a a management fee and a carry, because then it's just a fund of one idea. And that's not great. I want to talk about a few other things that you're involved with. So one of which I know is teaching and would love to hear how you integrate all that with what you do here. Yeah. So I've, gosh, probably about eight years now, have taught a class at the University of Cincinnati. That's where I went undergrad. So I have an affinity there. And I teach a MBA course on alternative investments. Now, you're from the East Coast. There are a lot of people in this business out (laughs) on the East Coast or in the West Coast. There's just not as many in the Midwest. I also think the world is going that way. We talked about private capital and everything else, but you think about just technology, Most people in investment classes and courses around the country have this vision. They're going to go and pick stocks or pick bonds. And there will be people that do that. There will just be less because some of that analyst work is going to be replaced by artificial intelligence. You're seeing the continued wave of passivity. You're just seeing artificial intelligence replace the whole thing in certain times. And you're seeing better returns on the private side, but not many universities teach much on alternative investments. So what I try to do is at least give them an introduction to all the different types of alternative investments. I'll teach a section on private equity, for example, and then I'll bring in a private equity manager who's often visiting FEG to come in and do a case study for them and also share the story of how they got into the business because yes, your job in college is to get good grades, but your real purpose is to get a job. And so sometimes just learning how you get into the business, who you need to talk to, what kind of backgrounds are helpful. And so I've been doing it for a really long time. I absolutely love it. And if anybody would ever sit in any of the classes, they would probably see a lot of FEG educational materials that I use. (laughs) The last one before we turn to a couple of closing questions I'm fortunate to be here with you in Cincinnati today on a particularly special day for FEG. So 
maybe talk through what's going on here. Yeah. So it's great to have you in person here in Cincinnati. So a lot of firms do a golf outing. I hate golf. There are plenty of people at FEG who love to golf and certainly love an invitation to play golf, but I'm a hockey guy. I love hockey. It's a passion of mine. And there just happens to be a good handful of hockey people at FEG or spouses that play hockey. And uh, gosh, one dinner one night where it was a big group of people and we're talking about hockey and they're like, well, I play hockey and five people in my office play hockey. And so we're like, what if we did a charity event and we invited a bunch of our managers and clients to come in and play a hockey game? And so it's great. Over, over about a couple day period, we have 20 or 30 different managers coming in. A couple of managers just love hockey and they just came to watch some of their friends in the industry play. And we have all these manager meetings that we can meet with our managers and then we can play and we support a charity. It's called Cincinnati Icebreakers. And their tagline is putting your disability on ice. It's just really cool that you can get out there, no matter what disability they have, they're flying around and they're having a great time. And for some of them, this is the only time they've ever been able to be a part of a team or ever travel to a tournament and be in a hotel setting and, and do all that. So it's, it's very special for them. And so we try to raise money for them. We've done it the last few years. Unfortunately, COVID has impacted that. So this is our first time that we're, we're doing it. It's just really fun. It's fun because we've been able to then connect managers together. Like we had two players the last time we did this who hadn't seen each other, really knew each other were in the investment business. One played at Yale, one played at RIT and they played against each other. And they're like, oh my gosh, I remember playing against you. And so they start talking and you know, some of these people share ideas and, and like, hey, we're in two totally different areas. You're in private energy and, but I'm doing some, looking at some private energy dad and now we're friends. We played hockey together. So it's a really cool thing. All right, Greg, any other pressing things you're thinking about that we haven't touched on? Pressing things that we're thinking about. Well, inflation, right? That's, uh, I don't know if we're going back to the 70s. I, there's very few of us that remember the 70s. It feels like it might rhyme. So I, I, one of the things that we're thinking a lot about, you need to make sure you have real assets and you probably should have a diversified basket of real assets because inflation's weird. It reacts very differently to both expected and unexpected. There's no silver bullet. And we're in a period of time where usually conventional energy historically has been the best way to play inflation. But you have a lot of ENFs who have divestment campaigns who can invest in carbon, and that's okay. But for those who can, there's a real opportunity because when you hear Shell and Exxon say they're divesting, it doesn't go away. They just sell it to a private equity firm and it's kind of out of the shadows and there's no money going into any CapEx and development there. So the money that's going there can return a pretty good amount, even if you assume the terminal value of the stuff that's left in the ground is zero. And so that's one way. You can't. Is copper a way to play the EV revolution renewables? So we've looked at some things there. But inflation has been top of mind rates and how the Fed reacts to inflation, that's probably the biggest thing. And no one's seen, you and I have been around long enough. We've got some gray hairs, but you think of the 20 and 30 year olds, you just buy the dip. And if you can't buy the dip, if there is no Fed put, how do you invest? And so people are going to have to kind of learn on the fly. All right, Greg, I want to ask you a couple of closing questions before I let you go. We might know the answer to this one. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Dad, you, you know it already. <laughs> During the season, I try to play two or three times a week. We have a private winter club that's really close to my house. So sometimes I'll even go skate before work. And I, I am multitudes of IQ points smarter if I get oxygen in the brain and I'm skating and I come to work and I'm happier. All right. If you could start over today, money was no object. And you couldn't be an investor, asset allocator, consultant. What do you think you'd most like to do? So I would have said teacher, and I've been able to scratch that itch a little bit. I love to cook. That's another hobby of mine. I love to entertain. I'd love to open up a dive bar slash restaurant. That's probably what I would do. What's your biggest personal pet peeve? I hate when people are late. It drives me nuts. I'm very scheduled. And 
when people are late, it just throws it all, all off kilter and I just hate it. That's my biggest pet peeve. How about on the investment side? I don't like some of the arrogance that comes from certain managers. Maybe it's because I was born just background, I was born in White Plains, New York, but I grew up in Cleveland. And maybe it's because I heard all the Cleveland jokes over the years. My, you know, your river caught on fire or your sports teams are terrible. And I, I don't know, maybe it's just a little chip on the shoulder. But when you, you go in and you meet with an investment manager and they want to know if Cincinnati is on mountain time or, <laughs> or they want to explain something, you're like, have you been in New York before? And you're like, oh, just that lack of self-awareness, it drives me crazy at times. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? So there's a lot of people. There's always been a person that showed up in my life that has taken me to the next level. And I don't want to miss any of them. So I'll just acknowledge all of them, but I'll give you two fun ones. So I'd say two people that have the biggest impact on my professional life. Oliver Stone for his 1987 release of Wall Street, which I snuck into and I saw it. I'm like, this is what I want to do. And then Peter Lynch for two reasons. One, I read his book, One Up on Wall Street, loved it. Probably the first investment book that I read. And my college fund was in the Magellan Funds. So Peter Lynch was obviously the PM, famous PM for the Magellan Funds. What's the biggest mistake you've made and what did you learn from it? So investing, as you know, you make a lot of mistakes. (laughs) So two things. One, acknowledge you're going to make mistakes. And that's okay. It's about the sizing of your mistakes and sizing of anything. So be careful about sizing. And two, if you've been doing this long enough and your spidey senses go off, dig a little deeper. Those would probably be two lessons that I've had to learn over the years. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Just a work ethic. Growing up in Cleveland, my mom's side, everybody worked in the steel mills. My great-grandfather worked in the steel mills. My grandfather worked in the steel mills. My uncle spent some time there between college and the steel mills. And there's this great work ethic that we had. And even when I was in high school and prior to high school, if I wasn't playing sports, I was working. My parents said, you're working. And I had to put half of it away into my college fund, the Magellan Funds. And that's really stuck with me, that blue collar attitude. I admit that I have no blue collar skills, but I had that work ethic, that Midwestern work ethic. And that's really stuck with me. And it's from my family. And if you let me have one tangent, because this is a fun fact. This is good, Dad. So I had all kinds of jobs. I was a teamster for Anheuser-Busch on a beer truck delivering beer. That, that was a great job to have in high school and college, <laughs> by the way. I love that. People love me. I worked at a catering area, but I also spent a lot of time at the local grocery store, country counter. And I weighed vegetables. I worked in the produce section. and Sometimes they would stick you out on the counter. And so someone would bring you a, a cantaloupe. And you'd put it on the scale and you'd write how much it, it costs. Nowadays, they just do that at the checkout line. But where at the time that I was doing that, I got to weigh the bananas of Bill Belichick and Steve Kerr. So a great basketball coach and a great football coach. And as you could imagine, Bill Belichick was surly when I weighed his bananas. Steve Kerr was very positive and happy. <laughs> and they just both happened to live in the area when I was there. All right, Greg, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I can be wound tight at times. I think I would tell a younger version of me that it's, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. You don't have to fritz over every job decision or that meeting you had with your boss or that manager. Or Most times things work out. Enjoy the ride. Smell the flowers. Okay, Greg, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time. An important disclaimer from Janice Henderson Group, PLC. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principle and fluctuation of value.